Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There is a reason that we lock our doors at night when we go to sleep. It is because of people who lurk in the night, people who could do us harm. And this case is about one such person, a person who you will see on one particular night prowled through our community looking for opportunities to go into spaces that weren't his to go into and to take things that were not his to take. And the most important thing that he ended up taking that night was the life of a woman, a woman named Samantha Wool, who you will hear was a somewhat prominent member of our community, the president of the downtown synagogue. And on the very last night of her life, on a night when someone was lurking in her neighborhood, she left her front door open. She gave him an opportunity to take from her. And that mistake turned out to be tragic because at her home, at a place where she was supposed to be safe, she was stabbed to death. And the evidence in this case is going to show you that the man who did this to her is this man right here, the defendant, Michael Jackson Bolanos. They didn't catch him in close, until close to six weeks after her death. But when they did, he still had her blood on a jacket that he wore that night and on a backpack that he wore that night. Now, I want to walk you through the evidence that you're going to see and hear throughout this case, but I want to, I want to frame some expectations and some understanding up front, because when Samantha Wool's body was found outside of her home on October 21st, 2023, her death was a mystery at that time with very few leads. And you're going to see that this case was investigated by something called the Homicide Task Force, which includes homicide detectives from the Detroit Police Department, investigators from the Michigan State Police, and personnel from the FBI who worked together to identify Samantha Wool's killer. And part of what you're going to see in this case is the many steps that were taken in this investigation to show you that this was an investigation that started out very open-ended at first with other suspects, other persons of interest looked at. And the investigation used cutting edge investigative techniques, including forensic data from various sources, including forensic science to zero in on the defendant. And I want to caution you, the presentation of this sort of forensic data, it's not splashy, despite the camera that you're going to see in the courtroom throughout the trial. It shouldn't be dramatic, it's tedious. It's time intensive, which is why this trial is gonna last so long. So I'm gonna ask for your patience throughout this process. And that's especially so because for the first few days of the trial, you're not gonna see any evidence even directly implicating the defendant. Instead, we're going to show you the same evidence that investigators had to work with at the early part of this investigation, the same clues that they had the same limitations that confronted them, and the same foundation of evidence that was ultimately put into place that led them to the defendant. Now, Samantha Wool lived in the Lafayette Park neighborhood of Detroit, just across the I-375 freeway from, from this courthouse. And she lived in a community of townhomes. And on October 21st of 2023, at about 6.20 a.m., one of her neighbors found her body outside. She was outside of a unit right next to hers, 1368 Juliet Place. She was bloody. She was barefoot. She was cold to the touch at that time. When the police arrived, they found a trail of blood that led from her body to her townhome at 1366 Juliet Place. There was blood on the door inside the hallway leading to the living room. There was blood on the floor. There was blood smeared on the walls. Inside the living room, there was more blood. 
pillows and blanket on the floor, her contact lenses on the floor, suggesting she had been asleep before this attack happened. And when the police started to investigate her activities leading up to this night, they found that she went to a wedding in Sterling Heights that night and got home at about 12.30 a.m. And the police got a hold of her cell phone, which was found near her couch, and they performed something called a forensic extraction on that phone. They got all the data that they could on that phone so they could analyze it and try to see what her activities were leading up to her death. And they found a couple of important things. First, they found that her last outgoing text message was at 1.02 a.m. She simply sent a, a heart emoji to one of her friends. Second, they found that her phone was last unlocked between 1.29 and 1.35 a.m. That would have been the last time something necessarily requiring human input into her phone would have had to have happened. Her phone was passcode locked. So that narrowed the suspected time range of her murder between when her phone was last used to 6.20 a.m. Now the police also found that she had an ADT system at her home, an alarm system. And there were sensors for that system. There was one by the front door. There was one attached to the back door. There was one attached to a basement door that led to a, a common hallway shared by other units in the building. And there was a, a, a motion sensor in her living room. And the police went to ADT and they used a search warrant to get, to get data from that system to see if there was any information they could get about the system's activities the night of her death. And what they found was that although the, the ADT system wasn't armed that night, the system was still collecting data. And they found that at 12.31 a.m., her front door opened, consistent with her getting back from the wedding. They found that at 12.32 a.m., there was motion present in her living room. At 12.35 a.m. until 12.38 a.m., her back door briefly opened and then shut. And when police arrived, they found that the door had been shut and it was in the locked position when they arrived. At 1.01 a.m., there was a message in the data indicating that the front door was still open and there's no indication that the front door ever closed that night. At 1.24 a.m., there's an indication in the data that that living room motion sensor was idle, meaning it wasn't detecting any more activity inside the living room at that time, any more motion. The next time that activity was detected, the next time motion was detected in the living room was at 4.20 a.m., and the system was idle again at 4.22 a.m. So that naturally made 4.20 an important time in this overall timeline because that was the last time motion was detected in her living room after she stopped using her phone. Now the police went back to the scene a couple of weeks later and they tested the ADT system and they pulled another data set to try to see whether the system was working and to see whether the times were accurate and they found that the times that were in the data were accurate within about 12 seconds of real time. You're going to hear that an autopsy ultimately concluded that Samantha Wool died of a total of eight stab wounds. All of the wounds were concentrated at her shoulders and above, focused on her neck and her head. This is the general information that investigators had to work with at the outset of the investigation. But there were limitations. There wasn't a video inside of Miss Wool's home that showed what happened. They looked for videos of other townhomes in that area to see if they could find anything capturing who came and went that night, but they couldn't find anything. They canvassed the neighborhood for eyewitnesses to see if anybody heard or saw anything relevant that night, and they didn't find anything. The closest thing they found was you'll hear from one of the neighbors who will tell you that he heard what he describes as a woman's voice at around 1.24 a.m., but it sounded to him like an older woman's voice and nothing violent. 
Now, there was a lot of blood at the scene, but that blood, to the extent it was tested, was identified as Miss Wool's blood. There were some fingerprints left at the scene, mostly in blood on the walls. And you're going to hear that many of those prints were not of sufficient quality to be analyzed to identify someone, and those that were came back to be Miss Wool's. There were footprints in the blood on the ground, but the footprints were bare footprints, suspected of being hers. The police talked to people at the wedding that she went to, but they couldn't find anything suspicious that had happened that night. They talked to dozens and dozens of people, friends, colleagues, family members, current, former romantic interests, but they couldn't find anything alarming or actionable. They couldn't find anything that led them to a true suspect. Now, the first major potential break in this investigation happened on November 7th of 2023. And that potential break, you will hear, was something that didn't even involve the defendant. You're going to hear that Miss Wool had an ex-boyfriend named Jeffrey Herbstman. And you're going to hear that on October 22nd of 2023, uh, the day after Miss Wool's body was found, Mr. Herbstman came in to speak with the police and, and gave a statement and was cooperative. And he will tell you that the last time that he saw Miss Wool was on October 7th um, after seeing her at synagogue. He will tell you that the night of her death, he was home after he returned from synagogue and he stayed there all night. He will tell you that they dated for about a year from approximately October of 2022 until July of 2023, but that their breakup was generally amicable. But you will hear that Mr. Herbstman has a history of depression and that he did not take her death well. And on November 7th of 2023, you're gonna hear that he was in Kalamazoo for work and he called the police during what he will describe as a panic attack. And when the police came and questioned him about why he was upset, you will hear that in a frantic state, he told them that he had essentially convinced himself that he may have killed Miss Wool, but he couldn't remember anything about it. And he couldn't articulate why exactly he felt that way. Now, because Mr. Herbstman made that incriminating statement, when he testifies at trial, he's going to testify with something called use immunity. And what use immunity means is we can't force somebody to sit in that witness chair and acknowledge that they previously made an incriminating statement. And so for the hour or so that he's in the witness stand, whatever he says can't be used against him in a future criminal proceeding. But you will hear that what he says is not anything that could be used against him in a future criminal proceeding because he will tell you that he had absolutely nothing to do with Samantha Wool's death. And he will tell you that when he said what he said on November 7th, he had just gotten an increased dosage of the antidepressant that he was on. He used some cannabis and he had this one time delusional panic attack that set in and prompted him to feel what he felt and say what he said. But because he said what he said, he was deemed a suspect, and the police looked into him. And they tried to collect evidence against him. And they had this ambiguous statement from Kalamazoo. You're going to hear, though, that the police did not find any evidence placing Jeff Herbstman at the scene the night that Miss Wool was killed. They didn't find his DNA at the scene. They didn't find his fingerprints at the scene. You're going to hear about a lot of video that was collected from surrounding areas. He didn't materialize in any of that video. You're going to hear that they didn't find any evidence that he left his home that night, that his phone placed him at his home the entire night after he returned from synagogue, consistent with his statement. You're going to hear that they searched his cell phone. They downloaded it and forensically extracted it at two different points first on October 22nd when he first came into the police and then again in Kalamazoo when he was taken into custody after he said what he said and they didn't find anything incriminating on his phone. You're going to hear that they tore up his car, they tore through his home, and they didn't find any physical evidence connecting Jeff Herbstman 
to Samantha Wool's death. They found a knife in his car, a pocket knife. It was forensically analyzed. There was nothing relevant found on it. Uh, they found a couple of items in his car, um, including a dog collar that initially tested positive for suspected blood, but it turned out not to be human blood. Samantha Wool's blood did not show up in his house, in his car, on his clothing. And Jeff Herbstman was eventually released and cleared as a suspect. Now what you will see is that when he was released, it was publicly reported that a suspect was released in this case on November 11th of 2023. And the very day afterward, it was later found once the defendant's phone was recovered, that the very day after that news report was made that a suspect had been released, the defendant was searching the internet for how to get out of town. Detroit same day passport showed up in his search history for that day. Now, while some of the investigation team was focusing on Jeff Herbstman, another part of the investigation team was focusing on the one other major lead that they had. And that is some video from near Miss Wool's home. Near her building, there is an elementary school called Chrysler Elementary School. And that school has a camera that points down Joliet Place. The camera isn't positioned such that you can see Miss Wool's unit or her building, but you can see the parking lot that Joliet Place dead ends into that is close to her building. And when police got a hold of that video, they, they scoured it. They looked at hours and hours of that footage. And what they found was that at 3.52 a.m. and at 4 a.m., just before that motion was detected in her living room, there was a figure in that parking lot who appeared to be tampering with some cars. Now, this caught investigators' interest because it tended to suggest that here we have someone engaged in criminal activity in the same area of Miss Wool's murder on the same night of her murder. It was also something that caught investigators' interest because that very same night, one of the cars that was parked there, and it's not visible in this still shot, it's just to the left of the green circle where the tree obscures part of the image, but one of those cars had its tires slashed that same night that Miss Wool was stabbed to death. So the police engaged in a colossal effort to pull as much video as they could from all of the surrounding area, any building they could find that had a camera on it, to try to retrace the footsteps of the individual that they saw tampering with cars in Miss Wool's parking lot. And they pulled video from dozens and dozens of locations. And when they analyzed that video, they got a pretty good sense of what this individual's trajectory was during the night of Miss Wool's murder. And when they were able to identify that individual's position at specific places and at specific times that night, the FBI went to T-Mobile to see whether T-Mobile could identify any cellular devices that were consistent with being in, those, in some of those same locations as this individual at the same time as the individual was depicted on video. You see, these, these phones that we, that we carry around with us, they're, they're constantly interacting with cell towers. Even when we're not making calls, data is being sent back and forth from our phones to cell towers. And our providers, like T-Mobile, keep records of that data. And that data can give investigators a, a pretty good idea, not a perfect idea, but a pretty good idea of where our phones have been at specific times. And when the FBI worked with T-Mobile to identify devices consistent with following the trajectory of the person identified in the video, they found that there was one device that matched that trajectory, and it was the defendant's phone. And you're going to see through a combination of that cell phone evidence and video 
you're going to see the defendant's route that he followed that night. And you will see that at 1242 AM, just as Miss Wool's night was ending as she got home from the wedding, the defendant's night was just getting started. And you're going to see at that time, he left his girlfriend's apartment in Midtown, Detroit. He was wearing a black North Face jacket, dressed all in black. You're going to see that at 1.44 AM, and in between these two times, 12.42 and 1.44, you're going to see that a combination of video and phone records trace him going from the Midtown neighborhood south into downtown Detroit, across downtown Detroit, and then over to the Lafayette Park neighborhood right near Miss Wool's home. And you're going to see that at 1.44 AM, he is in that neighborhood. He's just about a block away from her, her home. And he's still wearing that North Face jacket. And you're going to see that phone data suggested that he stayed right around that area for about 18 minutes on a night when her door was open, the first time he passed through the area that night. You're going to see that at 12.16 AM, and this comes from materials recovered from his cell phone that at that point in time he took a video from inside a secured parking garage at a building called the Ducharme Place Apartments which is just down the street from Miss Wool's home. He simply took a video of a car and then later texted it to his girlfriend. You're going to see from there phone records and video then trace him leaving the Lafayette Park neighborhood and going into the Rivertown neighborhood and that at about 3.05 AM, he's observed on video going into a parked car and emerging with a white bag. And that white bag is important, because in some of the video going forward after this 3.05 AM mark, the video is a little grainy. And it's hard to see exactly who you're looking at. But you will see that in the grainier video, that the person that's being tracked is carrying a white bag. And you will see that the person tampering with the cars in the parking lot right near Miss Wool's home, right before motion was activated in her living room, was carrying a white bag. You're going to see that at 3.12 AM, video and phone data places him in the Harbor Town area, where he is observed jumping over a brick wall into another secured parking area to tamper with more cars. You're going to see at 3.24 AM that he crosses back over Jefferson and starts moving toward the Lafayette Park neighborhood again. And at that point, at 3.24 AM, he's wearing the North Face jacket. He's carrying the white bag. And he's wearing what appear to be blue surgical gloves while walking alone in the middle of the night. From there, you will see that the phone data traces his route back toward the area of the scene, where you will see this individual tampering with cars in the parking lot near Miss Wool's home. There is a gap in video between 4 AM and 420, but you will hear from the FBI special agent who mapped the defendant's phone records that during that time, and especially at 420, at the very moment that that motion was activated in Samantha Wool's living room, that the defendant's phone was consistent with being right in that area. And in fact, he will tell you that if he had been looking for the defendant in real time at that point using the data that he has, that's the very first place he would have looked for him. You're going to see that at 4.24 AM, after that motion ceases in the living room, that the defendant is then on this side of the freeway, on the other side of the freeway, moving away from the scene still wearing the black North Face jacket, and now wearing what appears to be a gray backpack, something that he acquired along the way. You're going to see that video and phone records then trace him going back to his girlfriend's Midtown apartment, where he arrives and is welcomed by her at about 4.55 AM, still wearing the gray backpack and the North Face jacket. Now. The police arrested the defendant 
on November 30th of 2023. And when they arrested him, they had a search warrant to search that apartment, his girlfriend's apartment in Midtown, located at 454 mm -hmm. West Alexandrian Street. And when they searched that apartment, they found a North Face jacket that looked an awful lot like the one he was wearing on video that night. And that North Face jacket was sent to the Michigan State Police Crime Laboratory to be forensically analyzed. And they found that there were two spots of blood still on that jacket. And that blood was swabbed and it was tested for comparison with Miss Wool's DNA to see if her DNA was in that blood, to see if that was her blood. And you're gonna hear that forensic scientists, when they testify, they don't, they don't talk in terms of matches or, or certainty. They talk in terms of probabilities, scientific probabilities. But what they found was that the probability, the likelihood that that blood on his jacket was Miss Wool's blood was astronomically high. For a swab of the blood from the higher right sleeve, they found that it was 2.2 trillion times more likely to be her DNA in that blood. For a lower right sleeve swab, they found that it was 32 quintillion times more likely to be Samantha Wool's DNA in that blood. 32 quintillion is a number that is so large, it, it is 32 followed by 18 zeros. Now, when that jacket was found, and recovered six weeks after Miss Wool's death, there wasn't a lot of blood on it. It wasn't visible to the naked eye. But forensic scientists have tools to locate hard to find blood, to locate blood that could have been concealed in some way. One of those tools they have is something called an alternative light source. It's kind of like a black light. And interesting, you'll see that the defendant searched the internet for the phrase, black light sees what? October 31st, just over a week after Samantha Wool's death. You're also going to hear that this particular jacket was washed. Now, you're gonna hear that when the defendant was in custody after his arrest, he placed a recorded phone call from the Wayne County Jail to his girlfriend, who's named Tierra White. That's the woman whose apartment he was staying at, the woman who saw him off before he left the night of Miss Wool's murder, the woman who greeted him when he came home. And you will hear on one particular recorded call from the Wayne County Jail that they discussed this jacket. They discussed this jacket. And she told him that she washed the jacket as they were discussing why there wasn't a lot of blood on the jacket, she told him that she washed the jacket. And as soon as she told him that, you will hear that that call suddenly ended. And you will hear that several minutes later, he called her back and he lashed out at her for saying that. And he said, and I quote, I don't want to hear what you got to say about that shit. Now, at any rate, when the police arrested the defendant on November 30th, they also searched his, his vehicle that he was arrested in. And inside the vehicle, they found a backpack that looked a lot like the backpack that he was wearing that night. And that backpack, it turned out, still had some visible blood on it, a small spot but still visible to the naked eye. That blood was swabbed and sent to the Michigan State Police Crime Laboratory and they found that it was 20 septillion times more likely to be Samantha Wool's DNA in that blood than somebody else's. And again, that is a number that is so high, it's even bigger than a quintillion. It's, it's 20 followed by 24 zeros. Now, when the defendant was arrested on November 30th of 2023, he was given his Miranda rights and he agreed to make a statement with some detectives. And you're going to hear that during the course of this statement, he provided four different versions to them about what his activities were the night of Miss Wool's death. 
you're going to hear that at first he denied he was engaged in any criminal activity whatsoever. He then claimed that he was out taking pictures of cars for other people to steal, but that he didn't do anything wrong himself. He then claimed he may have tried a couple of car handles, but didn't take anything out of cars, and then finally acknowledged that he broke into cars and broke into parking garages and took things that weren't his to take. You're going to hear that during the first part of this in interrogation, that the investigators did not tell him what he was in, that he was under investigation for a violent crime. They did not tell him that he was under investigation for Samantha Wool's murder. Yet, during that first part of the investigation, he repeatedly volunteered to those detectives, even though there was no mention of violence on their end, that he didn't do anything violent to anybody. He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't rob anybody. And you're going to hear that he had no innocent explanation for that blood that was ultimately found on his jacket and his backpack. He denied seeing any body. He denied seeing any crime scene. He denied seeing anything out of the ordinary whatsoever. Now, when he was arrested on November 30th of 2023, there were also some knives that were recovered. There was a knife recovered inside his girlfriend's apartment, a pocket knife that was inside of a men's jacket. And there was also a knife that was recovered from his own person when he was arrested. And you're going to hear that when he was originally arrested, he was, he was pulled over in Roseville. And the trooper who placed him under arrest patted him down but didn't find the pocket knife. And so he sat there with this trooper on the way downtown for about 30 minutes without letting him know that there was a pocket knife on him. It was finally recovered once he got into the interview room at police headquarters. And when asked about the knife, the pocket knife that he had on him and why he had it on him, he said that he carried the pocket knife on him as a seatbelt cutter to cut his seatbelt off if he ever got into an accident. He was released on November 30th pending the DNA testing, but when the initial DNA results came back on December 10th, showing the blood on his jacket, he was taken into custody again and he was questioned again. And again, he had absolutely no innocent explanation for how Samantha Wool's blood got on his clothing. So in sum, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to see that on a night that the victim left her door open, that the defendant was in her neighborhood engaging in crimes of opportunity, that she was stabbed to death that night, and that his blood, I'm sorry, her blood, was still on his clothing weeks later. As a result of this, the defendant has been charged with murder, he's been charged with home invasion, and he's been charged with lying to the police. And at the conclusion of this case, I'm going to ask you to find him guilty of each and every charge. Thank you.